What's going on, everybody? You are tuned in to the Stone Down Sports Podcast, where tonight we are going to be talking about some ADP risers and fallers as we progress through the draft season. I think we all understand at this point that ADP, it's a living, breathing thing. It's constantly changing. And fortunately, as we get to this time of year, last weekend and this upcoming weekend are really the biggest fantasy baseball draft weekends. Everything is pretty much stabilized, but there are a few exceptions. And we're going to talk about, uh, we'll call it a dozen or so of those exceptions tonight. As always, Kyle is here. Kyle, how's it going, buddy? Doing great. Doing great. Glad to be here talking some more fantasy baseball. Love it. Um, If you haven't already, give us a like and subscribe on the page. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, Give us some chat comments. We're here to interact with you. Loving it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We're on the march to 200 subscribers, and we can't get there without you. That's right. Doesn't cost you anything (laughs) to subscribe, but it would mean the world to us. It would. Okay. First, riser. Zach Littell or Little. God, I'm not sure. Um, With the Tampa Bay Rays, um, he's moved up from 350 to about 326 in ADP right now. Been really the most impressive pitcher in Rays camp uh, this spring. Three starts. uh, He's pitched 10 innings, allowed six hits, one walk, struck out 10, yet to give up a run, an earned run. Um, I think he's definitely locked us definitely locked down a spot in in the rotation there. And you know the Rays, they're very good at getting the most, you know, out of their pitching staffs. Um, and I think that is going to happen with him. Last year he made 28 appearances, 14 starts, recorded a 410 ERA. Um, his K per nine was 7.4, walks 1.2 or walks per nine, 1.20. And 1.3 home runs per nine. So some things to work on. Not the best stats. um, But anybody uh, that rostered him last year knows that he can produce uh, in fantasy baseball. Um, Among pitchers with 90 innings pitched last year for him, uh, Lytell finished second in base on ball percentage um, behind a guy we talked about a couple weeks ago, George Kirby. So 3.2%. You're walking people. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Who we got in the chat? Dubo, what's up, man? No family dinner tonight. Made pulled pork and fries. So like the pulled pork over top of the fries, maybe drizzle some good cheese all over it. Oh, put yeah. cheese Matt's... on pulled pork, you put barbecue sauce on it. Yeah, you can put cheese and pulled no, pork. That's weird. Here, but... Don't be weird. But anyway, you're alienating our audience. Matt's not a cheese guy. Um, I guess we need to question. Well, first, of all, let me back up. He's got five good pitches. Um, but not really that true out pitch. Um, so you should probably see some regression on, on, on some of his stuff. I guess we need to question whether he can replicate last season's success uh, while throwing, you know, well, I'll say 140 innings this year. Yeah, that that's going to be the big question. The nice thing is he does have that dual RP SP eligibility. Um, and you look at his season on the whole, 19 and a half percent strikeout rate and you mentioned it just a 3.2 percent walk rate that's a nice uh, 16 we'll call a little over 16 percent difference between the two you'd like to see it a little bit higher um he's got some good stuff it's just a matter of putting it all together and and i remember when they brought him into the rotation last year my first question was like what 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 are you doing right you know i i don't get it um but in 11 starts from July 30th onward, 372 ERA, 65 and a third innings pitch, 48 strikeouts, only seven walks. And there is some swing and miss to him. He had 11% swinging strike rate. You know, you'll you'll take it. And considering he was going outside the top 350, now he's down to, to 326. And, and I imagine that's maybe even changed a little bit since I pulled this uh, ADP data a few days ago. Look at where in the hell he's going. It, it, in a 10-team league, he's essentially undrafted. In, in a 12-team league, you're talking 23rd, 24th round. Like, he's mm-hmm. free. Yep. Well, I don't – shit, I'd take his ass. Yeah. Yep. And I know you I, did in the home league. I did. Yep. I wrapped him up on a contract, too. Just hopefully I'll get lucky in a year or two. Uh, <laughs> what do we got? Dubo back in there. 
Funny, I did all that. Nacho cheese, barbecue, banana peppers over there, fries over the fries and pork. You all know what's up. Correction, I know what's up. I know that cheese belongs on that. Matt just doesn't like cheese. I don't know how you get through the day, Matt. Quite easily. Okay, next up. <clears throat> or, sorry, did you have anything else? Okay. No, I'm good. Uh, next up, Zach Geloff um, with the Oakland Athletics. He's rising. Not very much. Just a few spots from 128 up to 124. Kind of, he's, you know, on the lower end in, the, in this range. He's, he's one of my favorite second base targets, I think, this year. Um, earned that promotion to the majors last year and uh, belted 14 home runs across just 69 games. Pretty impressive. Also scored 40 runs, drove in 32, and uh, stole 14 bags. There's some, there was some uncertainty about his hit tool um, before he, he he debuted, but he slashed 267, 337, 504 in 300 plate appearances in those 69 games. So pretty good. This spring, starting off pretty good, continued impressing, pr- continued impressing. Uh, by slashing 375, 419, 750, and is third among all qualified batters in OPS this spring at 1.169. Very good. He's been doing that from the data I've read by staying on the ball forever in his swing and transferring a ton of energy into the ball, efficiently into the ball. Of course, he does strike out a lot. Quite a bit. Yes, he does. One of the highest I've seen in a while, 32 6. So that's a concern, but I'm still in on the young guy. Um, now, plays for the Oakland Athletics, right? Likely to be one of the worst teams in baseball. Uh, maybe not likely, but well, let's just say they're going to be the worst team in baseball. But he's going to be batting at the top of the order. So I think there's still going to be plenty of runs in RBIs. Um, I like him. Yeah, he's not bad. Um, I know there there's been some helium on him throughout draft season. I know earlier uh, in draft season, he was going around the 150 mark. So you've seen him steadily rise up the ranks. You're right. The strikeouts are concerned. I mean, he struck out 82 times in 69 games, 27.3%. He only walked 26 times good for an 8.7% walk rate. So that's, it's fine. It, it's average. Um, he hits the ball, uh, you know, pretty hard. 89 and a half mile an hour exit velocity is hard hit rates, uh, almost 41 and a half percent. However, you were talking about, you know, his hit tool and, and the concerns there, even with a 267 average that was buoyed by a 331 batting average and balls in play. I don't think that's sustainable. I, I think he can hover somewhere around the 310 mark. But if you lop 20 points off of his batting average, now all of a sudden we're talking about a guy who's struggling to get to league average. That said, he's a young dude, and and he's going to get plenty of opportunity to play there in Oakland because that team is is headed nowhere fast. And I think, honestly, he's going to be one of the bright spots on that team. I think his biggest value will come from home runs if you believe the power is legit and stolen bases. Because looking at the makeup of that team, even – this year and, and looking at last year, I really question where his run production is going to come from, right? Okay. He's probably going to be hitting towards the top of the order. Do you really want to count on the guys at the bottom of the Oakland athletics order to get on base in front of you for him sure. to drive them in? There's a, a couple decent players there. I'm I'm not going to lie, but you know, I, I think his biggest chance for run production is going to lie in run scored as a, as opposed to RBIs. He's not a bad piece going where he's going, you know, somewhere between the, we'll call it 10th and 12th round, 13th round, something like that. I see more upside than downside with him. So depending on on what my roster looks like to this point, sure, I can see taking a chance on it. Yeah. And I'd like to clarify the 32.6% strikeout rate was for the spring so far. And and 27.3 that you mentioned was for for last year. I might have said it the other way, so... Wanted to make sure no one was uh, confused. No worries, buddy. Um, Next up. O'Neill Cruz with the Pittsburgh Pirates. A lot to like about this guy, too. Um, He shot up the boards here about 10, 11 spots from 65 to 54. 
Um, one of the biggest risers the, this spring has really got to be him. He's 25 years old, had some bad luck last season. Um, I know he broke his foot early last year as well. Um, but he's done a lot of things to prove people wrong. Uh, this spring, he's smacking 100 plus mile an hour batted balls. Um, he's looking pretty good. He has the same number of hits this season, this spring, as strikeouts, eight. So I think that's really shows off his plate discipline. He's maturing. Um, he also has the same number of home runs than walks, five. He's nice. doing pretty well this spring. So uh, he's slashing 296, 406, 852 with 11 runs and eight RBIs. Uh, out of all spring training, he's had um, three out of the top four hardest hit balls. Pretty impressive. So, um, and yesterday he played, he smashed two 400 foot homers. So he's, he's really playing well. I see why he's, um, going up draft boards. Um, pretty good guy plays for yeah. the pirates, but pretty good guy. Yeah, he is. He is incredibly similar to Ellie De La Cruz. He's not quite as fast. He's also much cheaper when you look at where Ellie's going compared to, uh, compared to him. You talk about his, you know, him hitting 100 mile an hour rockets. He's got the hardest hit ball in the stat cast era, 122.4 miles an hour, which is just ridiculous. The strikeouts do need to come down. I know he's looked better this spring, but we're still talking a guy about a guy with a 33.7% career strikeout rate, which is not good, not good at all. Um, he has done a good job learning to lift the ball. His ground uh, ground ball rate has decreased in each season that he's been up in the show. But understand, his first year and last year, we're talking about incredibly small sample sizes. At the end of the day, this is a dude with less than 100 games of MLB experience. But considering the discount you're getting on him, over Ellie and just the the raw talent that he's shown us in flashes with the you know the light tower home runs and he can steal some bases. I don't think a 30-20 season is out of the question for this year. You're right, the team context is is not amazing, but there's a little bit of talent there on that Pittsburgh Pirates team and and we're going to be talking about a, another guy here in in just a few minutes to to help towards that objective. I like him. It, 54 seems a hair expensive to me. Mm -hmm. But if I'm somebody who is really in on the talent and what I've seen so far, I, I think that's a, a reasonable price to pay. It is. And maybe you spent up for other positions and, and, and sacrificed a bit. And he wouldn't be a bad sacrifice. No, not at all. Next on the docket. Where in the hell is he at? There it is. Anthony Rizzo, eventually. Is this shit going to come on the screen? It's on my screen, so oh, yours must be going slow. Yep. Hey, there it is, finally for me. All right, a little technical difficulties, but who cares? Um, his ADP, it went from 268 now to 237. He suffered a concussion last season. You're messing with stuff. I'm not. All I did was click the banner. I think there's something going on with your internet. No, it's possible. <laughs> Anyways, last year suffered a concussion on May 28th and tried to play through it before the, the injury. He had a triple slash, a 304, 376, 505, good for an 880 OPS. He had 11 home runs and 32 RBIs. After that, from June 2nd to July 31st, 170 average, 271 on base, 224 slug, a 496 OPS, one home run, and nine RBIs. We're talking about a dude who was on pace for a 30 home run, 90 RBI season, and it got derailed. Yeah. He's somebody who the short porch in right field there at Yankee Stadium plays very well for a left-handed hitter, especially one that pulls all of his home runs. He doesn't really hit the ball particularly hard anymore, but he still has a great eye at the plate and does an excellent job at limit, limiting strikeouts. Uh, his high walk rate makes him even more valuable in on-base percentage leagues. And we're talking about a lineup that is – really improved from last season. He's going to be hitting cleanup with plenty of protection behind him and a couple pretty good on-base guys in front of him. He's looked fantastic this spring, came in fully healthy, a 433 average, 1241 OPS, and a couple home runs with more walks than strikeouts and 13 games played. 
I think at this price, he is a fantastic corner infield option. Or if you're somebody who waited on first base and, and just decided, you know what, I'll see who's available in the 18th round at first base. There aren't a, a whole lot of better options available for you, especially where he's going. I think I'd happily have a, a spot for him on my team should the situation warrant it. Yeah, he definitely won't be a consensus top 150 pick ever again, but he can certainly return that kind of value. Um, especially with the beef, beefed up, you know, lineup there at the Yankees with the Yankees. He, he could be definitely, like you said, one of the most valuable first base options in fantasy baseball this year. Reports are that he's feeling healthy. So hopefully he can just put that last year in the rear view and, you know, get reinvigorated there. Um, he's definitely, if healthy, a pick after 200. He's he's a very intriguing fantasy option. Absolutely. We got Uncle Tad talking about Harold Ramirez. He was a solid option for you last year. Don't wait on a power position. Most people don't, but every draft is a, a little bit different, and I'm somebody who prefers to let the draft come to me. I go yeah. in with a strategy, but from there, it's uh, – you know, it, it's uh, it, it can be interesting and fun. Uh, what else does he say? <clears throat> oh, thing moved here. Darren will have first, shortstop, third, and outfield. Damn. I love me some multi position eligibility players. Yes. Uh, I, I would say both of our teams, our home teams this year, we both drafted uh, two or three guys with, with tons of uh, eligibility. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, it is. Kobe Mayo will have first, third, and outfield eligibility. Amazing. That dude is a damn monster. I cannot wait to see him up full-time in, in an Orioles uniform. He's one of, if not the best hitter in the minor leagues right now. Um, I know we talked about him on our, our prospect preview. Shit, it's been that was damn, early two January. months ago now. That was early Something January. like that. Yeah. And he's shown out. All right. Yes. So the next guy on our list, Henry Davis of the Pittsburgh Pirates. We just talked about Anil Cruz, and and you know I teased a little bit that we got another <laughs> pirate, and and here we go. Um, he's gone from two thirty eight to two oh six, which is a nice jump. This is somebody with an amazing prospect pedigree. He was a number one overall pick in the twenty twenty one draft. Last season, interestingly enough, he spent just two innings behind the plate and might not have catcher eligibility right away. You know, uh, yeah, but he was like over 400 innings in the outfield. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was wild. Yeah. Uh, and, and quite frankly, long term, he may just end up in the outfield or at first base, something like that. Yeah. But he did so show some promise last year in, in 62 games. The good, he had a 9.8% walk rate, 41.5% hard hit rate. Average EV, a, a little bit over average at 88.6 and a very, very solid 26.1% line drive rate. However, there was some bad as well. 27.1% strikeout rate, a triple slash, a 213, 302, 351, 653 OPS. Not that great, especially looking at the average, but we're also talking about a dude that had a, a OPS plus a 78 He's got plus plus raw power, but his hit tool it isn't too bad either. I think he's going to hit probably six in a lineup that's long on potential and short on consistent delivery. He has looked pretty good so far this spring. Four home runs, 11 RBIs, 306 average, and a 1075 OPS in 13 games. I think if things go right, he's a catcher that offers 15 home runs and maybe five steals and gets on base at an above average clip just due to his walk rate. And he is somebody who is pretty damn valuable in in dynasty leagues. Yeah, I think he, I think he could get double digits. I think he'd get ten stolen bases this year for you know uh, his sprint speed. He's in the seventy second percentile, um, so ten I don't think is crazy to fathom for him. Um, the catcher thing, yeah. Obviously, the sooner he gets that eligibility, the better, and the more value, more fantasy value uh, he becomes. There's a lot to like about him. I think he could, he'll hit, if he could hit like 250 instead of 220 or 230, oh God, oh baby, 
that would be awesome. Oh yeah. Um, and then yeah, dynasty. You mentioned that. You mentioned some first base. Could end up a right field. Could end up as a DH. If McCutcheon's you know hurt or not playing or something, it's possible. All things are possible through baseball. Okay. All right. Unk blowing up the chat again. Oh, did I not click that? There we go. Keep an eye on Austin Shenton in Tampa. He's a beast. Crushed it this spring. You are absolutely right. Thomas, I ain't going to butcher the shit out of that name. Is the Cardinals eh? next game? Yeah, we'll go with that. Sure. It's a geese. (laughs) <laughs> this dude coming in hot jace jung colt keith and justin henry malloy amazing time to be a tigers fan yes it is yes it is and casey mize oh yep mize is coming back reese olsen i i love the movement and spin rate that he gets on his pitches he's a fantastic late round flyer james wood that dude is a man absolutely yeah. That outfield there in Washington is going to be stacked over the next half decade, especially with him and Dylan Cruz and, and Lane Thomas around. That's a one hell of a trio. All right. So who do we got next? This is the last of our ADP risers. Bailey Ober of the Minnesota Twins. And he's had a nice little jump uh, uh, around 20 in, in ADP, went from 149 down to 128. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's even uh, up to lower. 128. Well, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But OK, <laughs> um, he doesn't really walk anyone. He's got just a 5 percent walk rate, averages 1.8 walks per nine, strikes out a hair more than a batter per inning, 9.1 K per nine, a 25.3 percent rate. He's got an excellent 13.8% swinging strike rate, though, and an outstanding 33.5% chase rate. So this dude doesn't hang around the zone too damn much. And and with the the horizontal movement that his pitches get, he really is is showing you that he can entice dudes to chase balls out of the zone. He did see an increase in both his ground ball rate and his fly ball rate and his home run rate more than doubled the 3.8%. And I think it's the home runs that are really keeping him from joining that next tier of starters. Um, You look at his hard hit rate at just 35.7%. It's well below average and better than our number one and and pretty much everybody else's number one pitcher, Spencer Strider, just to give you a little bit of context. He does a good job attacking the zone early in the count. 66% first pitch strikes, which is well above average. Doesn't really throw very hard, though. His four-seamer just clocks in at 91.3 mile an hour, and he's got an eight-and-a-half mile an hour delta between that and his changeup, which he is using his primary pitch, at least last year. Um, His slider and changeup both have roughly a 30% whiff rate, so you love the swing and miss there. He's had back-to-back seasons with a whip below 1.1. He's being drafted right now as a low-end SP4, high-end SP5, but if he can find a way to limit the home runs and find just a few more strikeouts, he's got SP3 upside. He does. He's put up some solid numbers. Um, 26 starts last year. 22 of those starts, three runs or fewer given up. I thought that was pretty awesome. Finished the year with a 1.8 um, walks per nine and a 9.1 strikeout per nine. The thing that concerns me is he did spend some time in the minor leagues towards the end of the year last year um, as the Twins tried to you know limit his innings pitched. Assuming that doesn't happen this year, he should be definitely a sneaky option later in your drafts. It's only 28. Um, he's got a career 3.63 ERA over 57 starts. So definitely they can bring some value. I like him. Yeah, he is. Uh, I admire Uncle Ted's optimism, thinking that Jack Flaherty is, is this year's Zach Eflin. Uh, let's see. I don't see it, but he's not going to get a ton of run support. No, he's not. 
I don't think he's ever going to get back to the form that he flashed when he was in St. Louis, quite frankly. Um, that doesn't mean he can't be a serviceable guy. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, Detroit's got him in there. He's probably going to line up fourth in the rotation between Maeda and, and Reese Olson. And I think that's a pretty good spot for him. And, and I think as long as we keep our expectations in line with reality and what he can bring, looking at him as a, as an SP four. Sure. Now, not for your fantasy team, but you know, in Detroit's rotation, I'm not holding out much hope. No. What do we got? Oops. Whoops. My bad. Australia. Christopher Sanchez with Ober. Forget aces. I want 10 number fours. Ooh, Christopher Sanchez is another dude to keep an eye on there. Um, I absolutely love the cheap pitching you can find this year. You know, dudes in the, you know, outside the top 150 and, and you know, in an auction league that are pretty damn cheap as, as well. Um, Christopher Sanchez. Yes, he's he's one of those dudes that, that I'll be keeping my eye on for sure. And we've got our, uh, I don't know if you saw it, Uncle Ted, but we have our um, podcast listener league. Sorry, my mind went blank for a minute. Hope you jumped in there because it, it is full. Uh, looking forward to that draft here on Sunday. Heck yeah. Who we got? Take that off. All right, so now we're getting into our ADP fallers. Um, the first one we have is Josh Lowe, outfielder with the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, dropped just a little bit right now from 78 down to 72. Guy was expected to take, you know, really another, I'll say, giant leap this year um, after breaking out in a big way last year. Um, but those plans are temporarily on hiatus uh, and he's on going to start the season on the injured list with an oblique injury last year. He slashed 292, 335, 500 across 135 games, um, 20 dingers, stole 32 bases, scored 71 runs with 83 RBIs. There's some risk here, you know, with him, some platoon risk, I, 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 I guess. And I think that he relies on his athleticism for fantasy. Well, that's much of his fantasy. <laughs> that's much of his fantasy. That's much of his fantasy appeal. How about that? That sounds a little bit better, but um, uh, I probably need him to fall another round or two from, from his current price, but right now I'd buy the dip. He's easily got 2020 potential. Uh, could even be a 30, 20 guy. If he gets a swing back early, if you don't draft him, this, you know, before the season, look for him to be a, a decent buy low candidate in April. Usually guys who miss, not always, but usually guys who who miss a, a, a bunch of time in the spring get off to a slow start in the season. And we know how panicky a lot of fantasy baseball managers can be, myself included, Matt included. <laughs> yes, just a just a little bit. You know, he's he's probably gonna be out until mid-April. Look, it, this guy turned in a 2030 season in his first year with, with regular playing time. And it always makes me think of that old saying, when somebody tells you who they are, listen. And I think last year, Josh Lowe was telling us who he is. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. I'm not really a fan of the 24.8% strikeout rate. The 6.2% walk rate is a little low. He makes hard contact at a little better than league average. I like the team context. Obviously, in, in Tampa, they're, you know, they're a damn good squad. They absolutely love their platoons. So like you said, there is some risk there. But when you turn out the way he did, it helps to minimize that risk. I'm going to agree with you in, in buying the dip. I think people are going to be scared off by the injury, especially in oblique, because that's something that can linger. I want to use that fear and, and trepidation that other drafters have to my <laughs> advantage. Bring him on in. I'll right. slash I'll stash him on the IL for for a couple weeks and and he's going to take some time to to get his swing back and and get going but I I think he can easily replicate what he did this year and and just how quickly he gets back I think he might even be able to to give you some gains on last year. Agreed. All right. 
We got a Cardinal. We're going to talk about a pitcher. Sonny Gray. ADP has fallen. He was in the 120s. Now he's pushing 140. So you're losing a couple rounds of value. And this is a dude, like, let's be real. Health has always been a concern. He's dealing with a hamstring injury now, but it's looking like he's not going to need an IL stint yeah. and is going to be available to start at the beginning of the season. Maybe not necessarily opening day, but in that first turn through the rotation. He's only started 30 games five times in 11 seasons. He's only given you 180 innings three times. So it's something you want to keep in mind as you look at him. His hard hit rate is just a tick above league average, but he does well at keeping the ball in the park. For the last five seasons, he's had a home run per nine under 1.0. Not really a huge strikeout guy either uh, in terms of total strikeouts, K per nine or strikeout rate. Last season was just his third with 180 or more strikeouts. This year, I'm thinking something along the lines of a strikeout per inning pitched for him. But what that number ends up being, your guess is as good as mine, quite frankly. <laughs> um, the switch from Target Field to Bush Stadium is a slight upgrade overall, so we kind of like that. Bush Stadium suppresses home runs more than Target Field does. But the Cardinals are projecting to be a worse defensive team than what the Twins were last season. So I'm expecting some regression on the 279 ERA. And, and again, ERA isn't all that predictable from year to year either, but with a worse defense behind him, I see him having a hard time matching that. The injury concern is costing him nearly two rounds of ADP alone. I think a healthy Sonny Gray is somewhere around a top 100 to 110 fantasy asset. I'm going to buy on him. Maybe he doesn't start opening day, so he starts – that Saturday. Like, I, I don't give two shits. I'll take him on my team. Yeah. Even if he misses a starter, too, I'm fine with that. You know, it, it, it means that the Cardinals are being, you know, cautious and looking at this uh, for the long haul, whatever long haul they're going to do in St. Louis. But um, he pr continues to produce at a high level. Um, I guess he's, I don't know, he's durable ish. That's not really a word, but he's only topped 180, what, once? I think since 2015, but he has tossed at least 115 every full season that he's pitched in. So mm, that's kind of what he is, I guess. I don't know if he's not really a sleeper or anything. He's just a. Uh, he's a solid uh, injury prone dude. Right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, I mean, he was what? Second in AL uh, Cy Young voting last year. So guy still got some um, gas left in the tank. He does. And if you go into him, if you go into picking him, picturing 140 innings, I think that's a little bit more reasonable than expecting, you know, 170, 180 innings out of him. Uncle Ted brings up a thing. Was uh, was this Uncle Ted that was talking about this a couple yep. of weeks ago? I wouldn't touch any starter before round 10. So Uncle Ted, when that run starts, you know, in whatever, sixth, seventh round, we'll just say, you just don't panic and you don't draft anybody. <laughs> I'm just like wondering if you're sticking to your principles or when that run goes, do you go, oh, shit. Just curious, man. Just yeah, curious. I mean, there is no theory that's 100% correct 100% right. of the time. You absolutely can find cheap pitching after round 10, but I'm also somebody, you know, I may not look at – the very top of the board for pitching. So your Spencer Strider, Garrett Cole, um, pre-injury, of course, or, or Corbin Burns. But I'm I'm looking for somebody like a Logan Webb to anchor my rotation. Somebody who's yeah. going to give you consistent innings, um, keeps the ball in the park, doesn't walk anybody. Give me that front uh front end there. He says he uh for every starter taken, I get another bet. I want a murderer's row. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, and, and it depends on your league too. I think our home league definitely favors pitchers. Yeah, um, it does. And um you gotta have them. You gotta have them. Yeah, that, that's right. the the great thing about fantasy baseball. You can build your team any way you want, especially with an auction league. And I I so much prefer it. I, if I didn't have to do another snake draft in any fantasy sport, I'd be all for it. <laughs> all right. Who's a gen ex jabroni tumbling down the board? We're going to hang out in St. Louis again. Bunch of losers. <laughs> that one's for you, Ramey. <laughs> Tommy Edmond, shortstop. 
look at him. He's shit. He just looks confused there. Like I doesn't even know what to do. He's now going outside the top 200 and continuing to drop. He had off season wrist surgery in October and he's not really healing as quickly as he or, or the team had hoped. And it's likely going to start the season on the IL. Um, I, I think fantasy players are tantalized by the multi-position eligibility at second short and outfield. Uh, he's got good contact skills, got an 84% contact rate, 16% whiff rate, got a good eye at the plate, only strikes out 15.9% of the time. He doesn't really walk, just a 6.6% walk rate. Um, because of that low walk rate, he's never really going to be, we'll call it like a, a big on-base guy. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind. And and even where his ADP was going before at 175, we've said it many times on here in that range, dude, have warts. Um, depending on how long he's out, he should log enough plate appearances to push for 10 home runs, but I'm not expecting a, a whole lot more than that. Last year, he kind of split between the top and the bottom of the order. So that's something you're going to have to pay attention to. Obviously, hitting lower in the order is going to guarantee you fewer plate appearances than hitting at the top of the order. For me, unless you're desperate for steals, I'm going to pass. Honestly, I, I look at the dudes going around his ADP, and I'd rather have somebody like Andrew Vaughn, Brian Mountcastle, or if I'm looking for pitching, I'll take Marcus Stroman. Yeah, he definitely likes hitting the ball on the ground. Posted a ground ball rate of 49-4 and 47-3. I guess that's a good recipe for, for someone with his skill set with being that fast there. Um, he's swiped 62 bags the last two years, so um, he's top 14% in uh, sprint speed, and, and he's only got and he only got caught three times in the last two years. That, that's pretty good. If he could, did you mention fly ball uh, or pull rate? Because if he could pull the ball more than 20.8%, and get closer to his career mark of almost 25, like it's a chance he could crack 15 homers. It's possible. But when he does come out or does debut, plenty of steals and some runs, I would assume. For sure. We had Uncle Ted. He's feeling it tonight. You keep bats on your bench or just a full pen. A lot of it comes down to roster build. I think I've got – um one or two bats on my bench. One of them is Colt Keith. So understand that our home league, it's more complex keeper league. We've got minor leaguers and contracts and, and shit like that. I'll spare you the details. Um, but I've got Colt Keith essentially for free this year. And so I've got uh, Isaac Paredes and Spencer Steer on my bench as well because of that multi-position eligibility. And then I've got three pitchers on my bench. So, yeah, I think we've got five or six bench spots. I think I've got Something it split 50-50. Like it all just kind of depends. But I got lucky this year, and, and I know nobody gives a shit about my home league, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because this is my show. I, <laughs> I absolutely love my pitching. Uh, it's an auction league, uh, uh, $270 budget, and I've got um, Logan Webb, Tarek Skubal, and Pablo Lopez for a combined $27. It's excellent. It is. And that's a, it's a great strategy to, um, you know, draft some cheap pitching and then lock them up on um, contracts and hope they, if they don't turn out this year, hopefully they turn out the next two or three years. It's great. I love it. And then, yeah, his, or his question about, do you, do you nominate the boring players first? Absolutely not. <laughs> Just like Matt said, yeah, yep. get some money on the table. Um, I'm trying to think who got thrown out first. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, Otani and, and Strider yeah. was out pretty quickly. Yep. Just watch that money fly, especially from dudes I have no interest in, like Mike Trout. Stream starters from my bench, as many starters as I can get. People stream starters from the waiver wire, but streaming from your bench is the way to go. Yeah, I, I get it. I'm more from the waiver wire. I mean, I'm constantly just churning over my couple of utility spots usually, um, and that's just the way it goes, trying to um, – get the hot streaks when they come yep. all right we got next we're going unk was talking about this cat earlier we'll talk yep. about him now braxton garrett lefty down in miami um he was around 209 now he is outside the top 250 
Uh, he experienced some shoulder soreness in February, but he threw live BP actually just as, just this past Sunday and looked sharp. Fastball was, was sitting, you know, 90 to 92. Slider and change were looking good as well. With him, he's going to miss a few weeks just because he needs to ramp up. But if you have the room, I think he's going to make a nice stash. He looked good last year in his first full season, started 30 games, give you just under 160 pitches or 160 innings pitched, mm-hmm. came in at 159 and two thirds, went nine and seven, a 366 ERA that was backed by a 368 FIP and a 342 XFIP. Gave you 156 strikeouts. Uh, 23.7% strikeout rate and come on just shy of a strikeout and inning at 8.8. The walk rate. Oh oh my God. He only had 29 walks last season, 4.4%, which is roughly half of league average. Just 1.6 walks per nine. It's amazing. It was 31 appearances. He had two walks or less in 29 of those appearances and no walks allowed in 11 games. It's yeah, you keep people off the base path like that. That's awesome. That's it. Because he needs to work on limiting his hard contact. Got an average EV over 90 miles an hour, a 45.3% hard hit rate. But he induces ground balls at, at just under a 49% clip. So he's not getting as hurt as some other guys would by that hard contact. But you look at the hard contact combined with an above average line drive rate. That's driving a 302 BABIP. And his career BABIP is 320. So I think it, as he gets better at limiting that hard contact and limiting some line drives, and, and maybe he can coax some more out of his ground ball rate, I think there's an opportunity to improve on that ERA. He plays in a, in a pitcher's park that doesn't really see a whole hell of a lot of home runs. Look, this dude is currently going outside the top 100 overall pitchers. And there's no way you can tell me there are a hundred better guys that you would rather have out there towing the rubber than him, even if he misses his first three or four starts. It, quite frankly, like I'm buying. Period. Yeah, That's it. Give him to me. Yeah, I mean, he was a surprise waiver wire pickup last year. Definitely, definitely is going to provide some some late round value in, in drafts this season. I like him. Um, do 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 do. Hold on. Um. But you could snake your sleepers for absolutely nothing if you nominate them early. Not in this, you know, not really in this league. I don't think. I think this is a very competitive league. There's some smart mofos in this home, in our home league. Um, I like everybody to bleed all their money, and then I try and keep a little bit more, and then nominate them late and get them for a buck. Yeah, and it, it things aren't like they were 20 years ago. Like there really are no more sleepers, right? Yeah, everybody you know, knows. It, Everybody has access to the same information. It's how you act on that information and how much research are you willing to do that's going to set you apart. Yep. I agree. And I I agree on this one too. Whip is the only stat that matters. Limiting base runners in this base running era is so important. Yeah, it absolutely is. When you, when you think about that, one of every three base runners comes around to score. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Next up. We got shut him up. Yes, you are. Vaughn Grissom, shortstop with the Boston Red Sox. Um, he's dropped a bit uh, over the last few weeks from um, 230 all the way up to 287 in ADP. Didn't play very much last last year, just 23 games, 80 play, plate appearances, slash 280, 313, 347 with a sick OPS of. I, I, not even a sick. I can't even say disgusting. OPS six fifty nine. Horrible. Um, was acquired in the off season from where was he at last year? Atlanta. Atlanta. Yep. Yep. Um, Chris Sale. Yeah, and definitely an offensive upgrade at the position, but he um, suffered a groin strain uh, in the spring workout, so it's unclear exactly when. Uh, he'll debut, but when he was in the majors, they're very brief above average hitter, um, 74.4% zone swing rate and a 90.9% zone contact rate. Theoretically hitters with the best hit tools swing in the zone while making above average contact. Um, over the past two seasons, 17 hitters had that 90% contact, uh, or a <laughs> 90% zone contact rate and the 70% swing percentage. One of them's Grissom. So, 
Um, strikeout percentage was was better than average at 18.8, but the walks uh, uh, needs a ton of improvement. Two and a half percent. There's no excuse for being that low. Not good. Um, I will note that he's currently only eligible at shortstop in most leagues. Um, he'll have that second base eligibility, you know, soon after he finally debuts. It won't be opening day, but we're looking at mid-April, probably late April, according to Alex Cora. If that guy could get 500 plate appearances, you know, uh, he hit 280, maybe 10 home runs, 58 RBI, 64 runs, and 11 stolen bases, I think are very possible. Um, I like it. Yeah, he is a great example of a, a post-hype sleeper. Come up to a lot of fanfare in Atlanta. Everybody was talking about him because, it, it, quite frankly, the dude can hit. Um, he, he's he profiles like a balanced hitter. He's got league average power, above average bat-to-ball skills, and above average speed. Given where he's going, I really don't see anyone else on the board with his upside at this point. I mean, you're you're pushing 300 overall. Like these are all lottery tickets. Um, I wish he didn't hit so many ground balls. And and I think as the the coaches work with him there in Boston, I think he's somebody who can really take advantage of the green monster there and just turn into a doubles machine. Yeah, with his speed. that's true. Um. Remember, like, this is a dude who's just 23. He only has 216 big league at-bats. Um, he's fine for where he's going. Like I said, I, I don't really see a whole lot of uh, other guys going around 300 with any kind of upside at all. So, yeah, throw him on the bench. Let's see, you know, how he does or, or throw him in an IL slot. He'll come back, get his back going, and, and see what's up. I don't have a whole lot of hope for the Boston lineup this year. I, I don't think they're going to be like, you know, garbage like Oakland. Um, but I don't think these are going to be the the kind of um, – yeah. it, it's not going to be the kind of season you're used to seeing in, in Boston. Quite yeah, it's frankly. not much there. There's Devers. There's that Tristan Casas. And, and that's about it. Yeah. Jaron Duran's yeah. all right. Yeah. Um. Uncle Ted says Grissom can really, really hit. Just blocked in Atlanta and hurt last year. I agree. Brandon James Cargill in the house. What up, man? Thanks for the the, the ride to the airport today. Uh, have you seen the uh, stat comparison this spring between Javi Baez and, and Leonard? Could you really sit Baez? I mean, I could. Yeah, Baez is uh, 32 at-bats with a 208 OPS and two whopping RBIs. And yeah, Leonard just killing it. 29 at bats, 379 average, 1.159 OPS and 11 um, ribbies. I mean, I got 98 million reasons not to sit him. Piss on that. I, I mean, just you're you're going to have to eat it. It was a stupid contract. Thanks, Al. You know, I remember seeing it and it was just like, oh, my head like just went in my hands. Like, what the fuck are you thinking? Never seen a slider he doesn't like. And okay. now he doesn't even hit him anymore. I mean, yeah, he makes some uh, – the the miraculous athletic plays that he makes at shortstop isn't worth $98 million. Hell no, it ain't. And um, Yoshida is awesome, says Uncle Ted. Yeah, as long as you don't need him to field, he can hit. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, what do we got here? We last got one. our last one. Is this one mine? Yes. Jeez. Uh, Gavin Lux, shortstop with the Dodgers, um, dropped a bit, a bit dropped a bit from uh, ADP of two fifty four down to two sixty two. Uh, you know, I think we all expected him to really take on a bigger role this season um, with the additions of you know Otani and Teoscar Hernandez. They're projected to be a top two offense. I, I really thought Gavin were, was going to be able to get in on that. And, you know, I think anybody in that offense can really score 80 runs and 80 RBIs. Um, but he lost his starting shortstop role. Um, obviously, we know Dave <laughs> Roberts says Mookie Betts is going to take over the shortstop role. This spring, Gavin's uh, played in 11 games, nine for 35, all singles, scored six runs, drove three in, three walks, five strikeouts. So this leaves him really in competition for 
second base among, you know, Kike Hernandez, Rojas, Chris Taylor, uh, all four of those guys uh, haven't done shit. You know, nope. if you're, if you're including Gavin Lux. So it looks like a <laughs> likely platoon <laughs> between all of them. Um, Lux has been dealing with throwing airs this spring as well. Um, a game last week, the infield miscommunicated on a pop-up. Certainly looked like it was Gavin Lux's uh, fault as well. I guess there, there's also a slim chance he gets sent down. So in a large part to those throwing airs, he said several this year. I, I, I don't get it. I wonder if they would the Dodgers would be better suited to play Roja, Miguel Rojas at shortstop and Mookie at second. What do you think? It, it's possible. Um it, look, Mookie can play short, but he's out of position at short. He came up as a second baseman. They moved him to the outfield. All right, that's that's fine. But moving him over to shortstop because you've got four jabronis who can't play their way onto the damn field and Gavin Lux channeling his inner Chuck Knobloch, just throwing it all over the damn place, <laughs> yeah. but without the skill at the plate, isn't doing anyone any favors. I bet they wish they held on to Corey Seager, quite frankly. I bet uh, they probably did. I get, the best thing for Lux would probably be a trade at this point. Yeah. But, a fresh mm, start with a guaranteed uh, starting spot and some more at-bats I think would do him well. Don't forget, he was a top 10 uh, shortstop prospect in 2020, yeah, 2019. He's got, the, he's got the pedigree for it, just it doesn't deliver, and, and that's really the dice roll when it comes to prospects. Yeah. You know, people can look great. You know, I his average and on base percentage. I mean, they were 20 points above league average last year. Like, congratulations. Um, he does draw a walk. He was at an even 10% last season, which I, I'm not gonna bitch about that. But you look at it at his batted ball data and it just screams league average. The dude has no power to offer to, mm -hmm. to speak of. He's going in the high 200s for a very good reason and i would just scroll on past him quite frankly yeah. i have no interest in gavin lux uncle ted said it best gavin sucks you got it you got yes, it he does yes he does yeah bummer <laughs> So, yeah, just a few guys there we wanted to hit on and talk about. We could sit here and talk about, you know, all the big names and stuff. But, um, you know, we wanted to give you guys uh, a bigger picture, you know, where you can find some more value in the late, late rounds. Um, because I think that, you know, a lot of the talking heads and what's thrown at you on social media and, and various websites is all, you know, top 75 guys. Seems right. like. If you're telling me to draft Juan Soto, are you really giving me good advice that's going to help me win? Right. No. But if I can give you an idea of some players to look at later on in the draft, which is where you win your league, well, right. that and and being a waiver whore, as you call it, Kyle, um, you know you you've got to work the the waiver wire. You don't win your league in the beginning. It's those mid to late round picks that give you the the massive return on value. If I draft a dude for five bucks and he gives me eleven dollars of value, that's a nice little profit. It is, and 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 talking about drafting, you, you know, you can't win your league with your draft, but you can certainly fucking lose it. Uh, what do we got in here? Who's in here? Camel sauce? I'm butchering that. Uh, yes, you fan are. Fantasy wise, yes. Skill wise, I think everyone is overreacting. What are we? Did I miss something? I think we're talking. He's talking, or they're talking about Gavin Lux. Like, okay. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this is your first time joining us, but we come at things from a fantasy uh, perspective. Gavin Lux absolutely has the tools in his bag to be a successful major leaguer. But I think just at this point, you know, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, Kyle, a change of scenery, let him go somewhere, reset and get the reps at the plate that he yeah. needs in order to improve. Yeah, because he's not going to get them in uh, L.A. Leagues are won in the late rounds, a.k.a. the championship rounds. Yeah. yeah. And you got to be you got to be on it. Uh, the baseball season is a grind. Matt will Matt will is famous for saying that quite a lot, a lot. Um, especially, you know, daily moves leagues as opposed to, to we, even weekly moves leagues really uh, are a bit of a grind, but not like daily moves. But 
I love fantasy baseball. I love fantasy football. Hell yeah. <laughs> I love talking about them, but heck yeah. Awesome. Right. Good show, man. Yeah, it was. And, and, you know, I see we got a few people watching here. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday at seven o'clock. Um, and we drop the, uh, the occasional long form video as well. That's where a lot of our fantasy football content comes out. So, um, check it out. We'd really appreciate it. We're driving to 200 subs and, and we can't get there without you. Yeah. We just, uh, did a video over the weekend on, um, fantasy football free agency talked about a few players there i'll drop the link in the chats there for you guys if you want to check it out um but yeah excited for um what there's there's a baseball game tomorrow yes there is you getting up at 6 a.m to watch it i am not <laughs> i might i, I might. am not i would rather watch it on a delay or something but uh i gotta work tomorrow and then i'm headed to indianapolis oh shit Cool beans. Awesome. Uh, give us a like and subscribe here every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll be back Thursday. We are doing a mock draft. It's that time. This weekend's the, probably the busiest weekend or, or time period for MLB draft. So we want to do a mock one with you guys. Talk about it. If you guys got any questions, hit us up in the chat or the comments. Otherwise, have a great night. Yeah. We'll get this last word from Uncle Ted because it's positive. Great stream, guys. Hey, we appreciate you coming through, brother. Absolutely. Appreciate right. it. Have a good night, folks. See you Thursday.